Greetings to everyone joining us. My name is Mary Stella Simiu. I work with the Expression Information and Digital Rights Unit at the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria. And I welcome you all to a discussion today on the digital rights, on digital rights in Southern Africa. I am joined by two wonderful ladies today, Mwandita Theo from Malawi and Sikori Audrey from Zimbabwe. I'm just going to give them an opportunity shortly to introduce themselves. But just to give you a brief background of what we're going to be discussing, um, the Center for Human Rights undertook a study on digital rights landscape in Southern Africa this year and actually launched the report in August. And the findings of this report touched on the opportunities as well as the challenges in the digital landscape in Southern Africa. And on one hand, in terms of the opportunities that were discovered based on this research was that there has been this uptake in terms of adoption of digital technologies uh, in the African continent generally and also in the Southern African region. And largely this has been propelled by the COVID-19 pandemic. And what opportunity else that has been seen in this regard is the increased adoption of frameworks around cybersecurity, around cybercrime, uh, as well as data protection that are very relevant in the digital space. But it seems that the opportunities have actually been outweighed, outweighed by the challenges because we see while there's this been this increased adoption of laws, it, some of them are actually not in compliance with international human rights laws and standards. And when we look at our context in Africa, we know we grapple with issues such as um, poor infrastructure when it comes to internet, poor supply of electricity, high cost of data, which have actually advanced digital inequalities. When you look at the issues of digital divide, the hierarchies when it comes to digital inequalities in this digital divide space, we see that um, certain groups such as women, children, persons with disabilities and rural communities are disproportionately affected by digital inequalities. While still we see in this space, uh, there have been incidences of arrest of journalists as well as human rights defenders who speak out in the online space. We've seen concerns around misinformation and disinformation online, uh, concerns around online violence against women and children and other vulnerable groups, as well as violations with regards to privacy, right to privacy, violations around data protection. And this is happening in a context where they are not there are not there are no effective data protection laws, which is quite concerning. The list continues growing. Issues of network disruptions and internet shutdowns in Africa are concerning, as well as an emerging issue around attacks related to the medium and the use of strategic litigation against public participation lawsuits. So there are a number of issues that we are seeing in this regard in Southern Africa and in the African continent uh, generally. And these digital violations are being undertaken by both state actors and non-state actors. And really, there's a need for a multi-stakeholder approach and engagement uh, to ensure that we enhance the opportunities that we have, but really address the challenges that are being confronted in this space in a way that is rights respecting. And I'm hoping we'll be able to tease out some of these issues during our discussion today with our discussions of the day. So I'm going to first give them a chance to introduce themselves uh, and then I can move on to the first question. So I think I will start with you, Mwandida. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Mandida Teo. I'm from Malawi. I'm working with an NGO which defends and promotes human rights in the principal interest of young people and marginalized groups. So I work there as a program coordinator for human rights and civil society strengthening. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, Audrey, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, Stella, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Sikhelesile Ojimguni, and I'm with the National Youth for Development Trust in Bulawayo, right here in Zimbabwe, and I'm happy to be part of this uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Audrey, thank you very much, Patita, for joining us today. And as you can see, for Audrey, we, we only have her audio, and it's really very relevant to our discussion on digital rights in South and Africa, because as I'd mentioned, one of the challenges are around issues of electricity supply as well as internet access. And because of bandwidth challenges, we are not able to use the video and just the audio. And so it just really is very symptomatic of, of you know, uh, the relevance of our discussion today. But I'll quickly now go to the questions that inform our discussion and throw it to um, our panelists for the day. Um, you're coming from Malawi and Zimbabwe, respectively. 
I think I'll start with Mwandida. What are the significant opportunities and threats that you see that are facing digital rights in your country? Mwandida. Thank you so much. I'll start with the opportunities and then I'll go to spread to the threats. I think number one opportunity for me is that um, privacy is enshrined in section 21, subsection one of the Malawi's constitution. And also section 72, 73 and 74 of the Electro Electronic uh, Transaction and Cyber Security Act of 2016 also in a way provide limited data protection. So right alone, that is an opportunity that we are able to embrace that privacy has to, to be in our constitution and the Cyber Security Act, though it's limited protection. And also in uh, section 157 of the Communication Act of 2016, also provide uh, for universal service and access to telecommunications. So that one for me, I see it as an opportunity to say as a country, we are able to embrace that we, we should have universal services and access to telecommunications. And also I'll, uh, I'll give an example of the section four of uh, subsection one of the Communications Act, which mandates that the country's telecommunication regulator, regulator, which is Malawi Communications Regulator Authority, which we call it MACLA, ensure that the provision of universal services is made on affordable tariffs and that are accessible to all people. Whether you are in rural or urban, you have to access the, um, uh, the affordability of the tariffs. So those are the opportunities in it alone. But I must mention that there are threats to it. Uh, existing protections are insufficient to guarantee uh, the user's rights to privacy. Though we have um, a section which talks about privacy in our constitution and all that, but the, the, there is insufficient uh, guarantee to protect that light alone. Uh, Malawi does not have a specific data protection law. So as a country, we do not have a specific data protection law. And this a lot uh, puts uh, our data at least because I'll give you an example of when you are registering for the SIM cards. They take our, our, our data and even the uh, identity cards. So every citizen has to have identity cards and they correct all the relevant information for that particular person. But in terms of now protecting the, that same data, we do not have a law that protects for one's data. So they can correct the data as long as they want. But then the question is, how are we sure that the data will be protected when in our country we do not have such law? So that is a threat uh, in its alone. And also, uh, I must mention that uh, while the number of people with access to internet in the country improved from 9.6% in 2016, now uh, it's 14.6% as of 2000, uh, 2021. The number still remains low because as a country, we wouldn't be talking of 14% of people who access internet. That is extremely raw. And I would uh, give an example of even our neighboring country, Zimbabwe, where they are experiencing to the extent that she cannot uh, be beamed here on video because of the, 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 the internet interruption. So equally in our country, the number still remains low. And according to the survey which was done here in Malawi by MACLA, but also by National Statistics Office, it indicates that 14.6 of uh, the population of Malawi has access to internet. So it is so disheating to say we, we only have 14% of Malawians who access uh, information. And when it comes to um, urban and rural, there is only 40% of uh, uh, people in the urban areas that can access internet and 9% of the people in the rural areas that can access internet. So you may see that there's no balancing between those people that are staying in the rural and the urban. And in our context in Malawi, there are so many people that are staying in the rural, but there in the rural, there are so few people that have access to internet. And then when it comes to um, uh, female and male, uh, there's only 12.4% of female that can access internet in Malawi and 15.4% of male that can access internet in Malawi. So you can see the disparities there to say in the urban, in the rural, and then women versus men were still lagging behind as a country. 
And also, uh, I must mention that internet is so expensive in my country. So when people want to access internet, it becomes so expensive to the population, to the majority of Malawians. Most Malawians cannot afford to be on the internet because the prices are so high. And also, I should I, I should mention that there is inadequate ICT infrastructure in my country that in a way disrupts the internet uh, accessibility at that level. There's also inadequate investment and high taxes uh, on the internet itself. So when it comes to taxes, there are so many taxes, there are huge taxes on internet to the extent that uh, the companies that want to provide internet are not able to do that because of the high taxes that are there. But also just to lap up on this question, uh, in 2021, uh, inclusive internet index report ranks Malawi as a very poor uh, country when it comes to uh, internet. And there are four indicators that they were measuring and that is internet availability, affordability, relevance, and readiness. And it's pure, it indicates that in Malawi, I think we rank very poor on these four indicators. So you might see that these are just um, reports that are fresh, so fresh, but they are able to rank us that we are so poor in, in when it comes to internet access in Malawi. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you very much for that. You've really at least given us a very, a very broad picture of what is happening in Malawi right now in terms of the digital rights. And uh, I, 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 am, I am sorry to say that it actually looks uh, a bit dire in terms of when you look at the digital rights in Malawi and how we are supposed to compete in the African context and even in the global context when you're giving us statistics of about 14.6% only having access to the internet, we start asking how, our state, how are our states ensuring or enabling that as Africans, as, as, as citizens, we are able to compete with the rest of the world. It's quite concerning. You've also brought issues of taxes, by, which brings to me into my head, you know, barriers of entry um, in terms of providing this enabling economic environment. We see that even um, the state is not doing much in that regard, which is something that needs to be addressed. Thank you very much for, for kicking, um, kicking up the discussion with, uh, with, a, with a very good picture of what is happening in Malawi. And so I'll move now to Audrey to tell us what is happening similarly in Zimbabwe. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, so coming down to Zimbabwe, when I, I'm going to start with the opportunities. And um, the opportunities are there when it comes to um, digital rights in Zimbabwe. We have the constitution. Of 2018, uh, which provides for freedom of expression and access to information. So, because the con constitution is the the law of the land, uh, we expect that you know there's an opportunity for the citizens to express and express their views, no matter how divergent they may be, and to access information. And I'm um, also um, I'll come to the recent. Um, one which um, is the Data Protection Act of 2021. Um, it was actually um, put, yeah, it was actually put into enacted uh, just recently. You see, this one is the fresh one, but um, it speaks to increasing data protection so that it builds confidence and trust in the secure use of information and communication technologies. And um, here, there's an opportunity for people to actually sort of have power because you are allowed to um, to give your information. This it actually speaks to help data because your private information you can hand in your data. But then at the same time, when you feel like you know what, I don't want these people to have my data anymore, you can um, withdraw your consent to have your data input. So that's the class. Um, in terms of an opportunity, but then again, um, looking at the terrain that we have in in Zimbabwe, um, there's there are opportunities uh, for you know the government to work with relevant stakeholders to eliminate um, violence, bullying, hate speech, and misinformation. Where we see um, there are some organisations that have come up and are actually um, implementing. Pro projects um, that speak to the creating of a safe environment online 
And then also another opportunity that, is, that I see being there in Zimbabwe is one of continued lobbying and advocacy when it comes to access to the internet for everyone. Um, me being the civil society myself, um, we, we also work towards that because we want um, everyone to have access um, to the internet. And then also um, there's an opportunity and this is just based on the uptake of social media by the, the Zimbabwean uh, citizens, where we see that um, because people are taking out social media and you know digital technologies, there's an opportunity for the government to set policies that ensure free and open internet, which is safe for all. So there is room for, for improvement and growth in that regard. And um, just like Mandita said, um, unfortunately, we, we find that there'll be more of uh, more threats than opportunities. Um, so I'm going to move on to the threats and then, um, yeah. So looking at the threats, we have, just like Mandita pointed out, digital divide, it's also living and breathing in Zimbabwe, where we see lack of internet and electricity in marginalized rural communities, you know, further infringing on digital rights of the people, you know, and um, how do we see this? We see this through the poor digital infrastructure, you know, there's poor or no net network or internet network at all. As I am here, like I, I have trouble um, putting my video on because if I do so, I am not audible. And then unfortunately we have load shedding where electricity goes like almost on a daily basis. So that also um, hampers, um, our ability to actually access the internet. And then also um, the cost of accessing the internet, it actually remains prohibitive. You know, the high cost of internet data is out of reach of the average Zimbabwean, let alone the Zimbabwean youth and women, you know, and then that's not all when it comes to that. We also see that there's the constant increase in the data prices. In as much as it is expensive, it keeps going up. So that is a threat in itself. Um, and then also we look at surveillance. Um, this is something I've actually um, seen a colleague of mine go through and it's a big threat, especially with us um, going closer to the 2023 harmonized elections. You know, we see that the internet is not a safe space anymore. And then um, the fact that we exist both in the physical and online, we have profiles on online. So we are accessible through our online profiles and accounts. You know, people are able to monitor and track our movements and activities. You know, so I'll give a, a case in point, an example of um, a colleague of mine who is into voter registration mobilization. She's a female and she's very passionate about what she does. Unfortunately, um, she received a text some months ago warning her to stop her activism and her work. So that's a threat in itself. So, um, um, and um, also, in addition, we have cyberbullying and hate speech. And unfortunately, this is now rampant when it comes to you know, t teenagers, you know, high school, and even kids. You know, um, the, the internet is not a safe space for them either. And also, me being a woman, I know what that's like as well. We always see females, especially those who want to ascend to power, you know, the actions of power when it comes to politics. You know, you, you, you see them being. Um, talked down on and you know we have these bad words being thrown at them on social media and then also um, another threat that I, I see um, very often is the arrest of journalists and opposition politicians you know we speak of um, we speak of freedom of expression and access to information but then you find that when you express a divergent or, or something that's not in favor of party A or party B, you are likely to face the wrath of the law. And that is a big threat, um, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, those are the main ones that I can really think of right now. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Audrey, for that. And I can see a far similarities based on what you've said, what Mandita has said with the refindings of the, the report, the Digital Rights Landscape in South Africa report. 
and just uh, flagging some of the issues you've talked about load shedding. I was just mentioning you said it was happening in Zimbabwe. It's also a concern in Malawi and even in South Africa that previously in previous years, it was actually performing well in terms of um, a supply of electricity. But in the past two years, it has seemed like more and more there have been incidences of load shedding for a country that has been doing relatively well in Africa, that is also very concerning. And I think as a society, as societies, we need to start looking for alternative sources of, uh, of, of, of supply of electricity. But the problem more often than not, it falls on private, on, on private uh, pockets uh, and not the, the government, which can be quite um, costly. You've brought in an issue of surveillance of, of journalists and civil society organizations that has really compromised how we access the public space, because how can we be safe online how can journalists and and civil societies critical watchdogs in society use this space um safely in a way that will not comprom compromise their personal security that is a concern issues of harassment of vulnerable groups such as women and children really compromises and exacerbates the digital inequalities already faced by these um by these groups but you also already mentioned some some of the CSO initiatives uh, that are in Zimbabwe as opportunities so I'll move to Wandida and ask her about what CSO's initiatives have you seen actually uh in Malawi in regards to advancing digital rights and combating these threats facing this uh this uh, this field in your country Thank you so much, Mary. Um, one of the things that I have to put forward here is that uh, in my country, the issue of digital rights is a new concept. So the good thing is that stakeholders, including government now, is uh, agreeing to say digital rights are also rights. The way you enjoy rights offline, you can as well enjoy rights online. So that's a plus for me because now stakeholders uh, tend to realize that Digital rights are rights uh, 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 as well, and they can be enjoyed as we enjoy rights offline. So that's a plus to myself. And the initiatives that um, uh, CSOs have been doing, I've seen CSOs creating movements that advocate for digital rights. I know one um, a movement which is called Digital Rights in Malawi. Blings together CSOs so that they should be able to track digital rights in Malawi and to advocate for laws that uh, speaks in line with digital rights. I've also seen like from my end, the organization that I'm working with, we have taken up, uh, we have engaged government and relevant stakeholders on the issues of digital rights. So we are not just sitting down and watching what is happening, but we're also being able to engage relevant authorities so that we can work together in the talks of digital rights. I know that we have also collaborated with a Paradigm Initiative, which funded us on different initiatives that we've been able to bring on board government and also companies that provide internet so that we can talk on that level to say, moving forward, how can we make sure that an ordinary citizen also have access to internet? Because if we're talking of access to internet is a light that later in its own can open other opportunities, including freedom of expression, but also access to information. And also, uh, I want to share this, Mary and Cisha, to say, uh, like from my end, the organization I'm working with, starting from 2020, we have been able to be coming up with uh, annual reports on civic space. So these reports also have a component on, on digital rights. In, in, in itself. So these are uh, right, the, the 2021 report will be out uh, this month, December, and I'll be able to share with you just to appreciate to say, how is it coming up in terms of civic space and literally on digital rights? Because if we're talking of digital rights in my country, Malawi, we are lagging behind. And there's need for us stakeholders to pull up and to put pressure on government, not just government, but even institutions that provide uh, internet in Malawi. So there are so many initiatives that are happening around. And I'm happy to say um, last uh, last week we had um, a workshop, a three-day workshop, which was funded by ECNL. Uh, this workshop was about now making sure that young people also take the read in terms of digital rights, advocating for digital rights. Yes, we know that there's a movement which advocate for uh, digital rights, but also 
having in mind that young people are the ones that use the online platforms frequently and in malawi 60 plus population uh is is, is youth um related and we're making sure that we also have a movement a young people movement that advocate for digital rights and we have this uh movement and going forward i'll be able also to share what is coming up in terms of what we want to advocate as young people so that much as we have this freedom and right to be online but we should also feel safe that we are safe online and we can advocate for uh things that will make us safe online thank you Thank you very much, Madita, for that. I like how you mentioned how the internet, you know, access to internet is actually an enabling right and reminds me of the decision of um, the ECOWAS Court of Justice when there was an internet shutdown in Togo and the case was brought by Amnesty Togo. And the court in its decision, I remember I always go to that chapter where it states that while access to internet is not recognized as actually a human right um, and our, our international human rights framework, but the fact that it enables other right makes it a de derivative right. It enables rights such as freedom of expression. It makes it a derivative right that needs to be protected. And so we need to realize the importance of the internet as an enabling right for the exercise of other human rights. You've talked about um, some reports that you've released, which is very impressive um, because we need this report, this research that speaks to the different contexts to be able to inform advocacy as well as inform um, action by states. And even when it comes to state reports, you know, sometimes when states submit reports to the African Commission on Human and People's Rights about how they are complying with the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, for example, they fail to give this complete picture of what is happening in the states. And I believe reports uh, such as, you know, the ones that you've talked about, uh, including this movement that is being built from with the youth and including youths in this movement and just seeing the gaps that are I, I, with regards to digital rights in Malawi and in other countries in Africa, it means that there's a good reference point to be able to add to the reports of states and say, but you're not, there's something here, there's a gap here, there's need, that there's something that needs to be done further. So I'm very, uh, I'm very impressed with that from your presentation. And I'll move to, uh, to Audrey now. I know you had mentioned some CSOs initiatives in terms of um, advancing digital rights. So maybe unless you want to add to that, I could, you could add to that, but I'll post another question here. Uh, I know we have mentioned it here and there, uh, but what really has your state done? When we say they have the primary duty rests on states to ensure that, you know, we are, ensure the access and exercise of freedom of expression, access to information, right to privacy. This primary responsibility rests on states to ensure they promote, protect, and respect human rights. And they need to put in place the necessary measures for the exercise of these rights and, uh, by extension, the advancement of digital rights. So what has your state done? You could speak to CSOs as well as what your state has done in one. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Uh, let me just add one or two on the CSO initiatives. Um, there is the Media Institute of, of Southern Africa, MISA, um, which has a campaign called Hashtag Data Must Fall. I uh, really saw this is a very impressive campaign, which is actually um, advocating for internet access, you know, and access to information and, and enhancing freedom of expression and democracy. And also um, another thing that I saw was, is very um, important uh, when it comes to CSO initiatives, um, they, they are citizen journalism trainings. Why? Because um, so many people are taking up, you know, social media, like I said earlier, you know, everyone has the power now to actually be a producer of, of news. So um, we really, CSOs are really taking strides and ensuring that as as citizens um, who put out information on, on digital spaces, they should be able to do it, you know, in, a, in an ethical way, ethical manner. So you, you find that CSOs um, like the Center for Innovation and Technology, they actually have citizen journalism trainings so that people, the, the ordinary citizen is able to curate their own stories. So those are my two additions on CSO initiatives. And then coming down to what, the, the government on my side has done. Um, I will speak to the constitution of 2018 again, the fact that they have this written in black and white, it, it shows that 
there is an intention to uphold um, these um, these provisions of uh, freedom of expression and access to information. And the other thing that is not worthy is the fact that um, Zimbabwe is signatory to or party to a number of um, instruments like the African Charter Conventions on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, um, the African Declaration of Principles of Freedom of Expression, you know, the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of Children, and then, of course, the Maputo Protocol. Um, and also, lastly, the Charter on Elections, Democracy, and Government. So it means that um, the government has an obligation to implement these in good faith. All right, and then also uh, looking at um, um, other measures, we see, um, you know, after COVID-19, a lot of things moved online. So it also meant that education was also done um, online. So what the government did in this respect was, um, you know, we have the Ministry of Primary and Secondary Education um, actually launching a program to offer online classes, you know, via radio. And this was to try and bridge the digital divide. Um, yeah, so that's basically it. I don't know if I can move to the challenges of these, but yeah, that, those are the ones that I can really speak to right now. Okay, you've talked about challenges there. Maybe you could just speak to that one minute, two minutes before I move to okay. Andida. It's okay. It's okay. So um, in as much as I've mentioned all of these, I feel like they give and take at the same time, unfortunately. So looking at um, this launch by the Ministry of Primary and Secondary Education, you know, having online classes and everything, trying to bridge the gap, you know, when you look at the digital divide. Unfortunately, there is um, a clear unavailability of devices and limited coverage so in as much as the government is saying oh yes people can learn online oh yes there can be lessons online and all that stuff but the, you are basically talking to urban people you know what about the people in rural communities what about people in 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 those areas where they are unserviced like we have areas like Binga, we have areas like Lupani, Gai, those are marginalized communities so those are challenges that uh, we face as the people of Zimbabwe. And then um, also in as much as we have the recent Data Protection Act of 2021, um, unfortunately, in as much as you can, um, you know, have control, somehow have control of your information in terms of you saying you want to retrieve it or something like that. It does not prohibit internet shutdowns which have been used in the past to shut down freedom of expression so we have this big cloud hanging over us you know because you know somehow in as much as this act is now is now in play we have the elections coming up what if the shutdown comes down comes in again so that's, that's a challenge in itself the fact that these this the laws that are being put in place they're actually giving you with one hand and taking from you in the other hand Thank you very much for that, Audrey. You, you bring in this tension that we have uh, with our states in how they, they are trying to, in one way, um, implement their responsibilities when it comes to facilitating access to rights, enabling access to rights, protecting, promoting, and respecting rights, and then taking away from the other end. So this tension is quite, is quite interesting, and, and it, it, it really uh, brings in a challenge of how to hold our states accountable. You also talked about you know how with COVID-19, it forced a lot of governments to actually interrogate uh, to what extent that they are, they are, they are able, what, how we have integrated technologies, how technologies are necessary to ensure that we continue with our life given the COVID-19 pandemic and how it actually brought to the fore um, the inequalities when it comes to access, particularly for vulnerable communities that has really stood out from your presentation and in the context of Zimbabwe. Now, moving to the context of um, Malawi, Wantita, would you like to add anything on what your state has done um, or plans to do in terms of advancing digital rights and possibly what challenges they have experienced? Yeah, I think I'll go back to the section 157 uh, of the Malawi Communications Act of 2016, 
which provides for universal service and access to telecommunication. But still in terms of the challenges now, the implementation part of it, yes, we have an act which uh, says uh, there should be universal service and access to telecommunications. But with the statistics that I gave earlier on indicates that we're still lagging behind despite having this uh, act. Uh, in terms of um, uh, regulation, um, I must also mention that um, uh, regulation of digital space in 2016, Malawi had also enacted Electronic Transaction and Cyber Security Act, which is a plus for our country, but the, uh, the implementation part of it remains a question for us. And at policy level in 2001, uh, in, in 2021, I mean, the government of Malawi also launched an ambitious five-year digital economy strategy, which lands from 2021 to 2026, which sets new targets for different aspects uh, of digital economy. And among others, the government intends to expand internet access from current, uh, from the current statistics of 14.6% to 80% of the population and the broadband coverage of 90% by 20, uh, 2026. That is the vision that the government has to say they want to uplift the Malawians that have access to internet now, which is at 14.6%. It should at least go up to 80% of the uh, uh, population having access to internet, which for us is a plus. But then the implementation part of it, as it stands today, we are in our second year of the five-year uh, uh, the, the five year plan, is the question of how do we move forward in terms of implementing implementing this uh, uh, strategy because yes we can have good strategies on paper but the implementation part of it be taken into question and people should be able to track the implementation part of it to say are we being realistic that we can move from 14 percent to 80 percent uh and to me that is a good uh step to say we have launched this um uh, strategy and i must also mention that malawi also uh continued to operate the universal service fund, which is aiming at uh, increasing access to the ICTs through expansion of mobile uh, networks across the country. So this one is, is a good start because by the end of the day, we would want everyone, whether in the rural areas, in the urban areas, should be able to access these mobile uh, networks and should be able to access the internet. But as of 2021, the country had over 20 operational internet service providers, which is a plus to us to say now companies are willing to come in and provide uh, our services at that level. But then it also comes back to the issue that I had told, uh, I had explained earlier on, on the high tariffs to say, would we maintain these companies or some would drop, out, would drop off along the way? So yes, my country is doing good uh, in terms of uh, bringing strategies and in terms of having now uh, things in law that protect digital rights. But the question of implementation, we cannot do away with it. The implementation part of it, we are lagging behind and there's much, there's need to put much effort in terms of implementing uh, these strategies that we have. Thank you very much. It's, it's good that you, you brought in the issue of how realistic it is. You have plans. Your hearts are in the right, the hearts of the government is in the right place, but then how realistic are yes. the put in place by government? Because when you said 80%, I went back to 14.1%. Oh, wow, this will require a lot of work to jump from 14.1% to 80% within that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But encouragingly, they are yeah. the step in the right direction, if I call, call it that. Sure, sure. Indeed. Uh, and now uh, a contentious issue is usually elections. Elections is always an emotive issue in a lot of countries, um, not only in Africa globally. It's a very emotive issue. And Zimbabwe, next year you're having um, your elections, the harmonized elections in 2023. I know, Audrey, you touched on that a bit. But um, this is an opportunity to see, you know, how can we use digital technologies to improve, for example, information integrity, to improve the electoral processes? But then it also comes with attendant threats. And I know there are unique ones that come to Zimbabwe. Last two weeks or so, we were in Zimbabwe uh, as the Center for Human Rights undertaking um, a workshop that sought to capacitate community-based organizations on how they can combat disinformation during elections. So that was one of the flag threats we thought will 
uh, we, you know, is posed to the context, the electoral context in Zimbabwe. But I am sure just generally looking at digital rights, digital technologies and elections, they are unique uh, issues that emerge in Zimbabwe. So over, you, over to you, Audrey, in terms of what is happening in this space. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Asia, when you look at elections, that's a very, very contentious issue. Um, so when we look at technology and the huge role it plays, um, you see that because of technology, the citizens have access to information on, on electoral processes. And when you look at elections themselves, they are non-discriminatory, right? Meaning that everyone in the voting population, meaning that those who are 18 and above, or even prospective voters, or what are the strengths, you know, should have access to information that enables them to actively participate, right? So as CSOs, um, when it comes to the elections coming up and advocacy efforts or the actions that we, we should focus on, I think, um, first of all, we have to call for a level playing field, you know, we need equal coverage of political party debates in the media. And also, um, a playing field that allows for the free flow of information. And as CSOs, we really play a big part in that, in that regard. Uh, because it, in some point, in some, some cases, we are, we are the ones who actually hold these, um, these initiatives. We have radio shows, we have tutor spaces, we have physical meetings where we call on, you know, party, you know, representatives, you know, to come and, um, debate or even share their political manifesto. So uh, it is important that the playing field is leveled. Even when you look at, when I was speaking on media coverage, you know, looking at um, online, we also have TV and radio. Uh, what we see in Zimbabwe in most cases is that um, our media is mostly in favor of, you know, the ruling party. And um, as CSOs, we come in to say, everyone who is playing, who is playing in this field or wants to be president in the next election should be given an opportunity, you know, to 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 say who they are and what they they are promising the people of Zimbabwe, and then also looking at the growing use of social media, you know, um, as CSOs we are actually encouraging the use of trusted sources and platforms or accounts to access information on, on electoral processes or elections. You know, because the type of information you receive has a big bearing on the decision you make on election day. So as CSOs, we, we, we come in to say, you know, to the citizens, um, this is how you, 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 you track or how you see fake news and how you deal with misinformation and disinformation. And um, this actually helps them make informed, objective decisions when it comes to elections. And then also looking at um, other stakeholders. In this case, I'm going to speak to the most important one, which is the election management body, which is the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission. Um, we work with ZEC, um, but I think ZEC on its own should disseminate timely information, you know, on any developments around electoral processes. And this information should be shared on all social media platforms, TV, radio, online, offline. And um, the good part about um, our environment is that um, ZEC allows CSOs um, to be accredited by it. We, we are actually accredited as the National Youth Development Trust. So we are able to have conversations with ZEC and uh, we also encourage them to send out information timely, not to be sending out critical information, you know, when it's last minute and people don't have enough time to make, you know, informed decisions on what actions they want to take. And, you know, just now we are still going through the delimitation process where boundaries of electoral, electoral boundaries are being, um, are being made. So it's a critical development in the electoral ter terrain. So, um, yeah, it's important that ZEC keeps everyone up to date about what's happening. And we also come in as a CSO because we actually have structures on the ground. So working together with ZEC is, is, is uh, something that we are focusing on as CSOs. And then also as CSOs, um, it is very critical that we call for affordable data prices um, because, you know, information is now, you know, received through our te technological digital devices, you know, 
very few people buy the traditional newspapers, you know. So we have WhatsApp, which is widely used by the citizens of Zimbabwe. But um, in as much as there's WhatsApp, is it affordable? You know, is it accessible to the ordinary Zimbabwe? So that's what we, that's where we as CSOs come in. And then we, we want um, data prices to be within the reach of the ordinary citizen and um, so that the citizen can access information on elections. And then um, also looking at um, the, the, the laws that are put in, in, in place in Zimbabwe, you know, we have laws that speak on freedom of expression, you know, but then what you notice is that there's no freedom after expression. So as CSOs, that's where we come in and advocate or lobby for, you know, freedom after expression, because you can think you have this power, you know, I'm going to say this, but then the minute you just say something, I'm telling you, it's just, it's just going to be something. So that's where we come in as um, CSOs to actually advocate for, you know, things that are clear. When you're saying this freedom of expression, we want to know is the freedom after expression because people don't, are not preview of that. They don't know, you know, where they stand in regards to that. So, and then also looking at telecommunications, you know, companies, um, they should come in and ensure access to the internet is not hampered by, you know, disruption. You find that, you know, there'll be public debate or is their campaigns so you find that because this party is on this day having this uh, rally the internet is not working because there's live streaming you know next day you can't even access you you want to be you know you want to hear what's going on you want to see how things are going but for some weird reason the network just won't work on that day there are disruptions that you just don't know you know like where they they, they came from and then um when we look at looking at um, the, the last point that I just mentioned, I give an example to the internet shutdown, you know, 2019, where there were uh, protests against the dramatic fuel price increase, you know. So speaking of telecommunications company, I'm going to speak of Econet in this regard, that actually sent text messages to our phones saying that the situation was beyond their reasonable control. So we were like, okay, so if you don't know what's happening, you know, this, you know, it was just um, a clear indication that something just wasn't adding up and our enjoyment of the right to freedom of expression and information, accessing information was being infringed upon. So, yeah, that's basically where we stand um, as, as the CSO sector. And I think that's, if we really focus on these areas, um, I think we'll be in the, in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey, for that. It's just interesting, uh, everything that you've mentioned, and I see you zeroing in on issues of confronting these barriers of access, barriers of access to information during elections, and being very cognizant of the impact of lack of access on developing an informed electorate. Again, making reference to the soft law in instruments that have been developed um, by the African Commission, for example, the guidelines on access to information and elections in Africa. It does uh, give responsibility, start on responsibility of different state actors, the election management body, even civil society media, on the role that they should play in practically ensuring access to information uh, during elections so that we can build this informed um, electorate. But given this... Um, some of these institutionally implemented barriers to access. For example, you've talked about the internet shutdown, that it becomes quite difficult to see what's next when it's actually the state, state actors that are, are facilitating these barriers to access, particularly during elections. It's quite concerning in terms of the direction of, of our democracies in Africa. And uh, I just remember when you talked about how the service provider said it's out of their hands, and then you start wondering now, uh, there's still obligations for service providers that have been provided in, in international law, but clearly, um, realistically on the ground, it becomes quite difficult, and they still need for more advocacy in this regard. Thank you very much for that, and, and uh, really all the best to Zimbabwe next year, hoping there will not be at an internet shutdown or network disruption. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> During the elections, hopefully. We don't need uh, all these spotlights every time there's an internet disruption, network disruption, it's in Africa. We are really hoping that that will not happen again in Zimbabwe. Yeah. And we're about to wrap up. Um, 
I've really enjoyed our discussion today, but sadly, we are almost about to wrap up and now we move to recommendations. What recommendations would you give to the different relevant state actors, non-state actors, so this is civil society or the state or other actors um, in this regard, in terms of advancing digital rights? I think I'll start with you, Mandita. What are your recommendations? Number one recommendation for me would go to the parliament. Uh, they need to prioritize enactment of the data protection law and also provide for protection of personal data. We cannot uh, talk of digital rights if our data is not protected. So there's need for parliament to prioritize the enactment of this law. And also uh, just an appeal that our government here in Malawi has to remove prohibitive taxes on internet and mobile uh, services. Because when we're talking of uh, internet, when we're talking of mobile uh, services, we need to make sure that every Malawi and every citizen have access to these simple little things because it's a right and one has to have these uh, uh, things. So just to make sure that it's an appeal to the government to remove the prohib prohibitive taxes and also uh, which is on internet and mobile services. And also parliament should uh, hold MACLA accountable on the universal access fund. I, I have to explain a little to say uh, when it comes to universal access fund, there haven't been much accountability in terms of MACLA coming out to the uh, citizens to tell us how these funds are being used. I know that um, uh, they haven't accounted for the funds since the facility was established in 2016. And as it, uh, as it stands today, we are hearing of the reports that MACLA has over 6 billion Malawi kwacha. And the question is, uh, how are they using these particular funds when a local Malawian has no in, uh, internet and has no access to mobile services? So the parliament, not just parliament, but also civil society organizations have to make sure that they hold MACLA accountable to account for these funds uh, that, that are in the universal access fund. And also just an appeal to my country that Malawi should ratify the African Union Convention on Cyber Security and Personal Data Protection. It all comes back to say, if we are to talk of digital rights today, let's be flexible also to uh, ratify some of the uh, uh, instruments that are beyond Malawi. Yeah, that's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mandita. I see you reinforcing underscoring here, holding... <laughs> The relevant actors accountable, be it parliament yes. in front of amending laws and, yeah. and adopting the relevant laws at international law, as well as holding uh, other state agencies accountable. Thank you very much for, for that strong recommendation, for the strong recommendations. Over to you, um, Audrey. Okay, thank you. Um, my recommendation is that... Um, there should be a drastic reduction of data costs because they are really infringing on our rights to access information online. We exist online. We need to be online. We need to have access to the information that's online. So for that to happen, the data should be within reach of the average Zimbabwean. And then also um, the government um, should promote an, an, an enabling environment for digital rights and inclusion by amending or repelling repressive and, you know, archaic policies and laws. You know, like I was saying, you're giving us this with one end and taking with the other. That should really be amended and, you know, we don't want to, to be talking about the same thing over and over again. We are crying over the same issues over and over again. So I think the government should really act in that regard. And then also looking at improving digital infrastructure you know that's the other reason why people don't have access to information online don't have access to the internet you know so the government must work with you know a broad spectrum of stakeholders to ensure that you know there is a sustainable digital infra infrastructure in Zimbabwe you know when when you open up something it, sh it should be there it should live beyond you know the time that you said you wanted to be there because I'll just give an example of um, there's something that I noticed that uh, uh, in my research I was reading and then to say that in 2018, the Ministry of ICT, it actually pa partnered with Portras and established more than 200 community information centers, which is a good thing. But then as I continued reading, 
I noticed that, um, okay, this was actually done to reduce uh, the digital divide, which is a good thing, applaudable, of course. But then you find that these cases are not being serviced. So you find that you open this center, but then um, two years or three months down the line, maybe the laptops are not working, or maybe even the data is not being, you know, it's not topped up, you know. So um, there is a need for sustainability in that regard. So um, also another recommendation, um, I'll speak to the unwarranted charges against media practitioners. You know, it's the same song over and over again. You know, it sh they should be dropped in the promotion of digital rights, um, especially when they are uncalled for. Because sometimes you hear someone is in the cells but why are they in the cells? Why are they in the prison cell? They don't know. They're like, no, I was exercising my right. This is my job. I'm supposed to cover the story. But for some weird reason, I find myself in the cells. So I re my recommendation is that the unwarranted charges against media practi practitioners and activists must be dropped in promotion of digital rights. And then also, um, um, there's a need for continued consultative, you know, and awareness raising processes. You know, before introducing any technology that collects data from us, the people, we don't want to hear that, oh, there's this thing coming and it will be taking your data, you have to be putting your data and this and this. You know, because some, some years back in Zimbabwe, the teachers were, were told that they had to input their, their data online so that they could be able to access their salaries, something like that. So there was a lot of reluctance in that regard. I think it's the way that the whole initiative was sort of like pushed down their throats, you know. So that's why I'm saying that there is need for, you know, a consultative and awareness raising, you know, process before you introduce something as major as that. Because this is our information, you know, not everyone wants to go to a place and say, oh, this is me, I live here, and this is my next of kin, this is my number, my ID, and all that stuff. So government should really consult with the people first before they bring these big digital or technological changes. And then also looking at civil society organizations, uh, we should continue, I recommend that we continue engaging with governments and telecommunications companies for an, an, an enabling environment for digital rights and inclusion. You know, we see what they always, what, what the pattern, we always see the pattern, especially looking at elections coming up. You know, so it is a recommendation of mine to say civic society organization must engage with the government and Econet, Net One, you know, Telesol, you know, for the so that the, the environment that we operate on or they operate in is is enabling, you know, for digital rights to actually, you know, flourish. And then um, lastly, um, I'll look at the regional recommendation that I might just have is to say that you know we need a regional collaborate we need to have um, regional collaborative efforts that champion digital literacy you know there's a lot that we can work we can learn from each other when did state you know there, there, there's a report coming up and i'm excited i i hope i will be a, a, a privileged enough to actually have a look at that um report as well so there's a lot that we can learn from each other especially in this region so it's important that you know we go beyond our borders and see what our brothers and sisters are doing when it comes to championing digital rights. So yeah, that's that's basically it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Audrey, for that. Uh, just underscoring, you've talked about um, the importance of you know inclusive processes. You know, it, when it comes to these digital disruptions and what states are doing, and like what you said about ensuring public participation in this thing, so that we are carrying the public, the ordinary, the ordinary people in, in this digital, in this world of digital development. So I really like that because from both your recommendations, I can see that um, it's not all gloom. You know, we, it's not all gloom in our countries. There are initiatives in place. There are measures being put in place. There are laws that are coming in that, that have been implemented that laws that have been developed, that laws that need better implementation. So it's not all dread and gloom, that there's something that is happening in our countries, there's something that is happening in the African continent that is positively 
um, working towards advancing digital rights in South and Africa, uh, as well as in Africa in general. But they just need to do better for our states, need to do uh, better to ensure that their laws, as long as the actions that they have are actually rights respecting, that they're towards advancing rights in the digital space. And when you talk about, you know, um, penal sanctions, criminalization, harassment, targeting arrest of critical voices like media and civil society organizations are concerning thing that needs strong advocacy. And it really touches to what you say that, you know, we have freedom of expression, but we have freedom after expression. So um, I believe that is something that needs a lot of um, advocacy and issues of digital literacy, knowledge sharing among these peer-to-peer -peer networks uh, across regions, across countries, I believe it's very important. And I'm very grateful that um, you ladies were able to join us today for this three power panel of ladies <laughs> discussing <laughs> rights, despite the issues of digital divide, yes. uh, gender digital divide. I'm always <laughs> impressed and inspired to be in the presence of strong women speaking about digital rights and doing their role in terms of championing for digital rights uh, in our countries, in our different regions. So I was very honored to be moderating this discussion today uh, with you ladies. And the discussion, I have to agree, was, was very insightful, uh, very insightful, very engaging. And I look forward to see uh, further developments in our different context in a way that is rights respecting. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you very Thank much. You. Great. It brings us to the end of our discussion today and uh, thank you everyone who's followed us and will watch this particular uh, podcast thank you very much <laughs>